starting in verse 1, and we'll go through verse 8. As you turn there, I just want to let you know that this morning we are beginning a new series entitled Filters. Uh, temptation is never what it seems. And what I'm doing with this series is using the idea behind Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. Uh, you know your phones have those filters. Have you... If you haven't discovered them, your kids have discovered them, or your grandkids have discovered them, right? They can make you into a bunny. Um, they can make you into a person from Jamaica. Uh, they can, I mean, they can make you into a unicorn. Um, we know filters, right? Um, and so we're using that, that understanding of filters, Photoshop, uh, you know, all the little touch-ups that, that we do onto our pictures to make them look better. So this four-week sermon series, we're going to look at temptation and how temptation puts a filter over sin. So that it shows sin not in its ugliness, not in its real state, but makes it look pretty, makes it look, uh, you know, delightful and inviting. Uh, so we're going to explore in this series how temptation comes and how we can overcome temptation through the power of the Lord Jesus. So in doing that, we probably should go all the way back to the beginning, the very first temptation that we have recorded in Scripture. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This is what the Word of the Lord says. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say... You shall not eat of any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin cloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called the man and said to him, Where are you? This is the word of the Lord. Shall we give thanks? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we thank you that this account has been recorded for us, for our benefit, to, to instruct us, to teach us, to rebuke us. So that we may be thoroughly equipped to doing what you've called us. That we may be thoroughly equipped to handle temptation when, when it comes knocking on our door. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, the first temptation in the garden is like all temptation. It's deceptive, right? It's deceptive and it offers something good but only leads to hurt, guilt, and death. All right. So we have to understand that this first temptation is deceptive and all temptation is deceptive and it offers something promising to you. But it doesn't give you the full story. So to kick off this series, here are some examples of images that have been photoshopped or that have been um, touched up with a filter. So here's the first one. So I have the before and after, right? It's amazing what a filter can do, what a little Photoshop can do. Here's just a, a young lady standing probably at the park across the street, right, with the trees in the back holding an apple. But with the filter, she has a crown and she looks completely different. Next one. Ooh. I didn't say filters were all that bad, did I? I mean, you have this fine... Handsome man, right? But he has some blemishes. But wow, you just do a little touch-up and all of the stuff goes away. Isn't that what sin does? It hides the warts. It hides the imperfections. That's what temptation does. It hides it, so it presents it as something. I mean, think about it, ladies. Which of the two would you want to go out on a date with? Right? The guy on the right. Next one. Look at the 
filters. I mean, this was in the summertime, but the filter makes it look like it was in autumn time. It's amazing how deceptive filters can be. It changes the whole landscape. Next one. Here's a lady. I don't know why she's holding a lantern in the middle of a room. But add a filter to it, do a little Photoshopping, and now she's on a suitcase in troubled waters, and it's all dark. It completely changes everything. Isn't that how sin, temptation works with sin? Next one. We all know this one, right? All I had to do is say McDonald's, Big Mac, quarter pounders, and you automatically know, right? This is what is advertised on the right. Okay, that's what's advertised. What you get is on the left. Anybody ever been there? You, you go there and you're looking at the pictures of all the food that they have and you're thinking, man, that really looks delicious. I'll take that. And then when you sit down at your table, you're thinking, you look at the picture, you look at what you got. Now you see it side by side. Next one. And in fact, this is an advertisement of the, the Big Mac. The advertisement is on the left. On the right is the actual burger. And they note here, this is the most attractive angle. That's the most attractive angle. I don't want to know what the other side looks like. <laughs> but those two are not the same picture. They're not the same item. All right, next one. Even scenery, we can do a little touch-up. There's the before and there's the after. One looks a whole lot more inviting than the other. Next one. Again, before and after. You can do some touch-up on your... I think that's the last one. Is that the last one? So think about that, right? Filters. As we, as we proceed with this series, that's what we're looking at. The filters that temptation puts on sin. It changes everything. I posted a picture yesterday, and, and it, I put a filter on it. It was a black and white filter. We were over by Arnold's Park, and there was a little pier, and I took a picture of it. And I thought, boy, what would look nice just to put the mono filter on it, make it black and white? It changes the whole dynamic of the picture. And sin does the same thing. I mean, temptation does the same thing. Temptation does this. It dresses up sin, and it makes it look better than what it is. Nobody would fall into sin and commit those sins if it knew the consequences. If sin came to itself and said, listen, come to me, and you'll have a broken home. Come to me, and you'll have regret and despair. Come to me, and do None of us would do it. But sin is smart, and sin puts a filter on its picture, and it promises something that it can't deliver. We see this truth played out in the story of Snow White, right? I have an apple here, and it's not because if I preach late, I can eat, and you guys have to suffer. But, you know, we've, we, we watched the, the cartoon of Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, right? And there comes a point when the, when the, 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 the queen, the, the wicked lady that she was, Came this old, ugly, witch-looking lady, and, and she offers Snow White the apple, right? Now, the viewers, that's you and I, we saw a couple scenes before how she poisoned the apple, right? So we know, as the audience, that the apple, although it looks red and delicious, is poisonous, right? And we remember that scene where she goes to Snow White, and she holds it up, and she offers it to her. I don't know about you, but remember as a kid, you're watching that, and you're thinking, no, no, Snow White, don't do it. And she's like, oh, it looks so beautiful. Right? You remember that, that scene, how she's just captivated by its beauty. And it's an apple. Apples are good. Right? What's the saying? An apple a day? Keeps the doctor away. Anybody want a doctor to come to your house? No, you want to eat an apple a day so that you remain healthy. Snow White knew that. So she's thinking, wow, this is a delicious apple. This is a good apple. Kind of reminds you of Eve, right? Now, that wasn't an apple that she was being tempted with, but it was still a fruit of a tree. She saw that it looked good. Snow White said, oh, this is delicious. And we know what happens. She takes it, right? And she eats it. And she succumbs to the poison. She didn't realize it. Now, we have to believe that Snow White was smart enough that if she had known that this apple was poisonous, that she would have flat out rejected it, right? We'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Nobody would take a poisonous apple knowingly and eat it, but she didn't know, and that's the point. And that's where sin works. It doesn't tell us the poison that it's draped over the fruit that it's offering. 
Temptation is often disguised as something good and appealing, but yet deadly. I want us to examine this morning the temptation that Eve fell into. In verses 1 through 5, we see it's the temptation, right? Uh, we are first introduced to the serpent. I think it's interesting that the very first verse is introducing the, ser the serpent. And I think the reason why he introduces the first verse chapter the first part of this chapter with the serpent and not the devil is that it was more crafty than any other beast of the field the bible says right so what we're seeing is is that and where we're looking at the character and the nature of the devil through the tool that he used which was the serpent and we all know about snakes and serpents right i mean they're they're i mean they're they're just they can look pretty some of the designs on their skin are so pretty, but they can be very poisonous. I don't like snakes. I know there's good ones, but I call those dead ones. But uh, there are good ones that actually help us out. But it just snakes in general. So we get an image right through the serpent of the nature of our true enemy. We understand that the serpent wasn't really the one who spoke or who uh, deceived the woman. Um, or, you know, it was the devil using the serpent. We know this because the devil is the one who's described as the tempter in Matthew 4, 3 and 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. And from the days of Adam downward, he has been engaging and attempting to seduce people away from God. Think about that. From the time of what we just read with Adam and Eve here in chapter 3 all the way to our present time, the devil has been working overtime to deceive the whole world, to draw and to seduce our hearts away from the God who loves us and created us and away from him and to be in disobedience and rebellion against him. The instrument that the devil used was the serpent. The devil can always find a tool or a vessel that will do his will. I want to spend some time this morning examining the nature of this temptation. I think it's important. We, 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 we look at the temptation and we look at the, the results of the temptation because we live in the results of temptation, right? That's why we're clothed today. That's why we have gray hair today. That's why there's wrinkles around our eyes today. That's why we are in a constant state of dying from the time that we were born because of the results of what took place. But I want us to, before we look at that, is to focus on the nature of the temptation. And knowing the nature of the temptation, we can better equip ourselves when temptation comes knocking on our door. Or when a serpent comes and starts talking to us, we'll be better equipped to handle it. So it's a threefold part of the nature of the temptation. It's to call into question God's goodness, to bring to doubt and then disbelieve the word of God, and then finally to imitate the greatness of God. This is a three-part nature of the temptation. And note that in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, these are the three assaults on the second Adam that has come. And it's the same assault on you and me. The devil hasn't done anything different or new in the last 6,000 years since Adam and Eve walked the earth, since the fall of man. All right? He hasn't done anything new. He goes by the same playbook, but yet we still fall in the same trap that he falls. We're kind of like, we're kind of like the coyote. Remember coyote and the roadrunner? We, we, you know, we're thinking, how dumb can the coyote be? Well, look in the mirror. Because we fall for the same trap over and over again. And oftentimes, we're the ones that sets the trap, our carnal nature, right? You would think that the coyote would learn. You would think that we would learn. But we fall into the same trap over and over. Temptation comes. And it presents itself sweet and lovely. And we eat of its fruit. And the moment that we do, the guilt and the shame come crashing in and we promise God that we'll never do this again right only till the next temptation comes and we fall into the same trap again and again so the first part of this nature of this temptation and it's the first part of the nature of our temptation is to call into question the goodness of God the first aim 
part of this temptation, sought to throw a death blow to the confidence in the goodness of God. The devil's first hold in Eve's mind was tempting her to doubt the heart of God for her. Understand this, when temptation comes, the first assault, the first aspect is to call into question the goodness of God in your life. If you believe that God is withholding from you, you will go outside of his plan and timing to experience the joy that you're looking for and vice versa. Simply put, Eve bought the lie that God was withholding good from her. This tree looked good to eat. Its fruit was good for food. Is there anything wrong with seeking knowledge and, and an understanding? And yet God says of all the trees to eat, this is the one that you can. So automatically the first aspect of this temptation was calling into question the goodness of God. How could God, who is good to you, keep you from eating something so sweet and delicious? How could this good God keep you from more knowledge? She begins to think about it. And understand this, when temptation comes to your life, the first aspect is it will call into question the goodness of God. Why is God withholding that from you? Why is God saying that, that you can't partake of this? Why is God saying that you shouldn't do this? And we automatically feel, because temptation lies to us, and it's there whispering in our ear, wow, not that good of a God if he's keeping good things from you. And that leads us to the second. And it's to bring doubt, which will lead to disbelief of the divine word spoken. You begin to doubt God. It calls into question, if he's good, why is he good? Why would God keep something good from me? And then you begin to doubt and you begin to disbelieve the very word of God. Know this, God doesn't change. Now, I understand our culture has gotten woke. All right. And things that 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 were considered sin and abhorrent by our culture, they gotten so woke that they're saying, hey, that's old fashioned. Let's let's you know, we're, this is the this is the new millennia. Right. This is 2021. Let's get up with the times. God will never do that. Why? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God won't get woke. What he called sin in the scriptures is what he calls sin today. It doesn't matter if popular opinion, it doesn't matter if we vote a certain way that we're going to make this right. God declares it wrong. It is still wrong. But sin will tell us, but ah, come on, is it really that bad? We begin to doubt and disbelieve God's word. The second part of the temptation removed the fear of punishment from their path. Notice he just kind of removed it. By doubting, which led to disbelieving of God's word, it blinded her to the consequences that were to follow. We have to understand something. God hates sin, period. He's not going to wink at it. He's not going to excuse it. He's not going to say, well... I know you guys meant well, okay. Read the Old Testament, read the prophets. God's pleading with his people to repent, to turn away from their wickedness. He says, if you don't, destruction is going to come. My reading this past week has been focused and concentrated on Jerusalem because they thought, they thought that because they lived in God's holy city, that they could do whatever they wanted and God would be okay with it. And they were wrong. They thought that the temple which was God's place of glory. And it was there that there was no way that God would allow a pagan king to come in and desecrate it. And they were wrong. Because God loves his glory more than he loves the temple. God loves his glory more than he loves Jerusalem. God loves his glory more than anything. His holiness. What's interesting is that there's a portion in Jeremiah's uh, prophecy where, where God says... My house is to be honored. Have you made it into a den of thieves? And what did Jesus say and Mark that we just the series that we just finished up? You have made it into a den of thieves. And Jeremiah's prophecy is that because of that, the temple will be destroyed, and so will Jerusalem. You will be exiled. So when Jesus was 
saying you've made it into a den of thieves. He was tapping into Jeremiah's prophecy, and he was pronouncing it over the temple at his day. And in A.D. 70, the temple was ransacked and leveled, and not a stone was standing on top of another. And all the Jews in Jerusalem were exiled. You think God winks at sin? No. But the temptation will tell you, oh, you're not going to get punished. It's a, hey, all you got to do is ask God to forgive you. Go ahead and do what you want. And as soon as you do it and you feel bad, just ask God to forgive you. Because he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Right? Isn't that what temptation tells us? I can do it. I know I shouldn't do it. I'll do it. And then I'll ask God to forgive me. That's a dangerous game that we play. Temptation wants to invite you into that dangerous game. Because we understand that repentance is more than just feeling bad for what you did. It's a turning away from. But see, temptation doesn't tell you that. Temptation lies to you. Hey, you do whatever you want. God will forgive you. He's a good God. He's a gracious God. Hey, he loves you. Surely he would. God had warned Adam. For to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will result in death. That was just the previous chapter. In verse 17. He told him, you need all that you want from all the trees that you see. Except for this one. For the day that you eat it, you will, what, surely die. I would imagine that when they began to eat it, I'm not going to eat the apple. I'm sure they're like, you know, kind of crunch, crunch. Hey, we're okay, right? It's how temptation works. But see, temptation comes and causes the victim to doubt God's word. Even the, the children of Israel in Jerusalem, God really when destroys. Yeah, Jeremiah, you've been prophesying this for years now. And now what we see in our culture, Oh, you Christians talk about Jesus coming back. You've been talking about this for the last 2,000 years. Uh, is he here? Right? They mock. Temptation will show you all the benefits without the consequences. It's like that sleek car salesman, right? Have you remember, the, I remember there's different shows. You know, they always show the used car salesman in the worst light. And it'd be a complete junker of a vehicle. But it looks nice, right? I mean, it's a great deal until you take it off the lot. It will display sin in such a way that the buyer sees how wonderful and satisfying it will be, but will withhold the price that is required. It will say, this is, it's like those infomercials at, in, at nighttime, right? But wait, there's more. And, and you're just watching this spiel. I get to the point where like, shut up, just tell me the price. Because that's when you realize for only six easy payments of $199.99, you're thinking, what? Right? They don't tell you the price up front because if they did, you would turn it off. They tell you that you can cook and roast and bake and it'll wash dishes for you and clean your house. It'll, it's all in one machine and you're just like, you get sucked in more and more. And then they display it. And, and, and I just, like those cooking shows, everything that they make tastes so wonderful. I tell Mandy, can there be a show at once when they taste and be like, ooh, it didn't turn out good. But you never see that. All the recipes turn out so wonderful. They just eat it like, oh. But I also notice this. They don't take a big heap and bite of it. They just take a little, oh, this is so delicious. Oh, my goodness, I'm just going to be eating this all day. And then they never take another bite. That's what temptation does. It draws you in and it convinces you you've got to have this. You don't care about the price by the end because oh, I'll pay whatever. Just here's my, here's my credit card. Just. Ship it to me overnight. Temptation tells you everything that you want to know. And it will tell you what you want to hear. But it will withhold the price that it requires. The third aspect of the temptation, and it's a temptation that we face, is that it will imitate the goodness and the greatness of God. Verse 5, we've got to read this. For God knows, now he's talking to Eve, right? <laughs> it's almost like the devil saying, listen, I got your back, Eve. 
God's not really being honest with you, all right? Because what he says, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Talk about a good sales pitch that she bought hook, line, and sinker. The third aspect of temptation is that it appeals to our lust for ambition. Oh, be like God? Whoa. Well, now I know why he doesn't want me to have it. He wants to keep me under his thumb. See, we're calling into question the goodness of God. He's telling me no because, well, is he really good? If he's really good, why is he keeping him? He, wants, he doesn't want me to be like him. He just wants to control me. The devil promised Eve, you will be like God. The problem was the devil couldn't deliver on that promise. This was the appeal to her human lust for power, her ambition, and grandeur, greatness. That's the same thing that appeals to us, right? That's why we buy the things that we buy, because it's a status thing, right? We don't want a flip phone. We want one of those smartphones, right? Which most of us don't do half of what our phones are capable of doing, but that doesn't matter, because we got it, right? It's all about prestige. It's about our lust for power and grandeur and have, make us look good. Temptation always seeks to appeal to our carnal nature. It promises to fulfill our deepest longings and desires. If you will just buy this, if you will just do this, oh, all your dreams will come true. Now you will have purpose in life and all the satisfaction that you ever needed. It, it promises so much, but it delivers so little. Temptation aims to diminish the goodness of God by doubting his nature and his word and seeks to give us what we really want, to replace God with self. Because really at the heart of it, that's what it's about. We want to know and deem what is good. Notice he said, so that knowing good and evil, what does that mean? If I'm God, then I can determine what is good and what is evil. I don't have to worry about God telling me what is good and evil. And really, what do we see in our culture today? It is a rebellion against what God declares good. And God has declared certain things good, and our culture has said, eh, I wouldn't do without that. That's bad, that's evil. And what God has declared evil, our culture has embraced and said, it is good. And the prophet says, woe unto any people who call good evil, evil good. And that's us, that's our culture. We bought the lie of the enemy that we are God. We determine when we, well, we determine when life begins and we determine when life ends. We determine what, what, what life is uh, good. We determine what life is, is worth protecting and what life is worth discarding. We determine the beginning and the end of our lives. We are the ones that, we are the masters of our domain. Isn't that what we believe in our culture? We are the masters of our domain. We sound like God. We pretend to be like God. We act like we are God, but we're not. But that's what temptation has lied to us, and we've bought into it. And now we puff ourselves up as God. Separation from God, disobedience of God, opposition to and rivalry with God is the devil's chief he seeks to divide and to separate God from his people that he created. That he created to have fellowship with him. But what's funny is this, right? Isn't that what the devil said before he was kicked out of heaven so quick like lightning? That I will be like God. Didn't want to be above God. Just want to be equal with God. That was the lie that he sold Eve. That's the lie that he sells us. When we sin, when we fall into that temptation, really what we're saying is, God, even though you declared this wrong, even though you said I don't need to do this, I determine what is good and what is evil. Let's be honest. When we sin, that's what we're communicating. When we disobey his command, what we're saying is, is I follow what I want. I am the one that's in charge. And the devil joyfully watches us disobey and rebel against a God who loves us. 
For the devil knows that God's word is true. Here's the irony. He knows this word to be true more than we know this word to be true. Even the most godly among us, he knows this word to be more true than you do. Do you understand that? The enemy of our soul, he knows the nature and the character of God because eons before the fall, he lived in the heavenly realms with him. He knows God in ways that, that we don't. He knows when God says, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. God is true, and he is a man of his word, and the devil knows it. So he hides that aspect from us so that we blindly fall into that temptation, rebel against God, thinking that God and his mercy and grace will wink at our sin, and we are the exception, right? And he'll punish those people, but he won't punish us. This is a scary thing for the church in our country. If God didn't keep Israel and Judah and Jerusalem from collapse because of their idolatry and sin, why would America be any different? Paul talks about that when, when he grafted the Gentiles into the branch, into the olive tree. He says, if God didn't spare the natural branches... Don't think that he's not going to spare the, the wild branches. That's you and I. If God brought justice upon Israel and Judah and the surrounding nations for their sin and idolatry, don't think that America is God's favorite and that God will, oh, America, you can do what you want. It's not going to happen. The judgments that we read in Scripture on nations and their injustice and their sin and idolatry, we're all committing in this country. He, he brought Jerusalem and made it into a rubble because they would take their children and offer it to Moloch in the fires. We offer our children to the God of Moloch, the God of convenience and abortion. We're guilty. And I believe what we're living in in our time is a call for the church to understand how temptation works and to repent from that sin so that we don't fall prey like we have in the past. So that we can walk forward in victory. So that we, the church, can be a voice of hope to a world. Jeremiah was a voice of the hope of, of Jerusalem and Judah if they would have only listened to his cry and repented. I think another thing that we know with this temptation, and it's a temptation for us too, is beware of solitude. When we isolate ourselves, the enemy is quick to spring upon us. That's why attending church in person is vital. I mean, you all are here, so preach to the choir. But so many people, especially after COVID, have been reluctant to come back. And I understand the safety, and, and I'm not talking about that, but there comes a point when we got complacent and not coming to church that now it's not a big deal to not come to church. It's easier to watch in our pajamas with a cup of coffee, right? It's easy. I don't know because I was over here doing the service. But don't worry. As soon as I was done, I went home and I got back into my pajamas, okay? So don't think that I'm patting myself on the back. Beware of solitude. We see that she took the apple, I mean the, the, the fruit later to Adam, but in this discourse, we don't see that Adam was a part of this conversation. See, the devil wants to isolate us. You know, think about when you fall into temptation. Is there a lot of people around? Or is it just you? Oftentimes, the devil causes us to sin and lays that trap before us by first isolating, getting us away from people. So be, care, be careful of that. You see, the devil was extremely cautious as to moderate and to not let her know what he was really up to. Right? He was sneaky about it. He began with a simple inquiry. And he advanced so slightly as to obtain a footing in her heart. He never revealed the real intentions or the proper scope of what he was about, but he spoke with obscure and ambiguous language, right? Couldn't really pinpoint, really, what, what are you saying? He didn't let her believe that he was leading the conversation, yet he was, right? He was leading the conversation to where he wanted it to go, but he was so crafty about it that it seemed like 
he was following what she was saying in her thoughts, but he was the one in the background. Again, a Marvel update movie here. Remember the first Thor? If you're a Marvel fan, you'll know. First Thor movie. Uh, Loki. Loki's a good picture of how the devil works. You know, just a real likable kind of guy, but gosh, he'll stab you in the back the moment he gets a chance, right? And then he'll apologize, and you'll be like, oh, it's okay. I mean, that's just how the devil works. But in that movie, he gets Thor to go back to Odenheim, right, to the, the Grim Frost people. But it wasn't his idea. It was Loki's idea. But Loki just kind of like, well, you know, doing what Loki does. All the while, Thor thought it was his idea, but he was being played by Loki and didn't realize it. The devil plays us, and we don't realize it. And then he laughs at us. And then the devil pretended to be seeking Eve's good. And that's what he does with us, right? He pretends that he's really, he's really out for our good. And he's really out for our destruction. Have you ever wondered why fishermen put a worm on a hook when they go fishing? To hide the real reason why they're there, right? It's not about the worm. The worm is merely the attraction. It's the bait. It's to get the fish to come. Uh, fish aren't going to swim to a, a hook. You got to put some bait out there, something that entices them. You know, kind of hide what's really, what really is there. Fish are dumb, but they're not crazy, right? And again, some fish, I mean, they'll nibble that worm all the way off the hook, right? But you know, the fish that do that too often eventually get snapped. The way the devil works is temptation is out there, and it looks nice. It's enticing. It appeals to our eyes, to our flesh, appeals to us. But understand that behind the temptation is a hook. And the devil doesn't practice catch and release. He wants to snag us, to hook us. Not to say, take a picture and say, look what I caught, and then to throw it back into the water and like, go around and swim, little buddy. No, it's to take us and to fillet us and to roast us, to steal kill and destroy we know the final part of our text as we close adam and eve chose to eat of the fruit that was forbidden from them and today we suffer the consequences of that all the suffering the abuse the death the dying the tragedies that surround us today was and is a direct result of their rebellion against god now they lived adam lived about what 900 some years but he did eventually die he was kicked out of the garden, had to work by the sweat of his brow. Here he was tending the garden, and all was peace, all was wonderful. And then he gets kicked out, and thorns and thistles begin to grow, weeds begin to grow. And now he's laboring. It's almost like going against the current and trying to make a place in this life, all because of his disobedience. Not only did they sin and, and, and they brought death and destruction to the world that we see today, but they died that moment that they disobeyed God. They, their flesh was still alive. They were able to eat. I mean, again, he lived another 900 and some years. But he died spiritually that day. That's the worst kind of death. We can handle the physical death, but the spiritual death. That was the one thing that they, they weren't thinking about when they partook of that fruit. They were thinking physical death. They were just thinking here and now. They weren't thinking big picture. And the same is true for you and I as we close this morning. Temptation comes knocking on your door. Oh, it's, you know, you're going to feel a little bad. You're going to feel a little guilty. But, but you don't understand what sin does to the human soul. When we rebel against the commands of God and we disobey what he wants and we indulge in that sinful behavior, we are, we are disrupting the flow of his glory into our lives and if it continues then that will separate us eternally from him there's no such thing as a little sin think about this the first sin that is recorded in scripture was an act of disobedience don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the very next sin that's recorded in scripture was murder 
when Cain killed Abel. Powerful. There is no such thing as a little sin. Sin itself separates. It was an act of disobedience that separated them from God. It was an act of disobedience that got them kicked out of the garden. It was an act of disobedience that cost them their spiritual lives. It was an act of disobedience that cost an animal its life. Because if you read on, God clothed them with an animal skin. Think about that. An animal. He was minding his own business. Died because of their sin. Sin isn't anything to wink at. And we, we try to categorize him. Well, this is a really bad sin. And this is a somewhat bad sin. And boy, this is okay to do sin. All sin is bad. All sin will separate us from Christ. Understand this. The reason why Christians don't live victorious lives is for two reasons. One, they bought the lie from the enemy. Two, because of their lifestyle. Either we are obedient and our lifestyle is following after Christ, or we are doing what we want in the guise of following Christ. And so when we sin, when we disobey God, we are actually stopping that flow of his glory and of his presence in our lives because he is a holy God. I mean, think about this. When, when the devil sinned, Jesus said he saw the devil fall from heaven like lightning. We've talked about how fast lightning is, right? It's super fast. That's God's holiness. Sin cannot be in the presence of a holy God. So an act of disobedience separates us from his presence. But thank God that he made a way for us to repent. And to apply that precious blood that we, as we took communion this morning, reminds us that he cleanses us. You see, that's the good news. Grace isn't a, an excuse that we can keep on sinning because, you know, I just ask God to forgive me and I just keep on doing what I want to do. No, grace gives us the power to say no to temptation. Grace gives us the understanding that when temptation presents itself, we're able to look past the curtain. Like when Wizard of Oz, right, Toto looks past the curtain. And exposes the great terrible Wizard of Oz for who he really is. Grace is like that little Toto, that little dog, pulls back the curtain and says, yeah, this temptation, this is where it's going to lead. So grace gives us the ability to say no to sin. As we close, I know I said that earlier, this is my second closing, but this is the real one. What are we to learn from this? I think we learn that we have a duty to guard ourselves against temptation. Temptation itself is not sin. We have to understand that. All right? Jesus was tempted for 40 days, right? And when he was fasting for 40 days, he was tempted during that period of time. But he's without sin. So temptation is not sin. So we have to understand that. But what we do have to understand is, is temptation is the doorway to sinning. If we enter into that temptation... We are putting ourselves at risk of falling for sin. So we must learn that we have a duty to guard against sin. Eve should have told the serpent, shut up, get away from me. I'm not talking to animals today. Right? She didn't have to be polite. She could be rude to temptation. You can be rude to the devil. Tell the devil, shut up. Now, I know we're, we, tell, we taught our kids, you don't say shut up. It's not nice. Except to the devil. You can be as mean to him as you want. Learn from Adam and Eve. Temptation leads to sin. And sin leads to separation from God. When temptation comes knocking on the door of your heart, don't answer it. Don't look out the window. I want you to get your furniture and put it in front of the door. Put your bookcase in front of the door. Put your bed in front of the door, your dressers in front. All of your earthly possessions in your heart, put it in front of the door so that he can't come in and that you can't open it. The scripture says to flee the appearance of evil. I always find that interesting that it says the appearance of evil. I guess because God is giving us some credit that we know to run from evil, but what he's after is, if it looks bad, go the other way. 
Don't play around with it. Flee that. Temptation will make sin appear better than what it is. It will make sin appear to be the answer that you're looking for, the promise of all that you hope for. But understand this, it cannot and will never deliver. As we continue this series, I want you to remember this truth. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Nobody, nobody wakes up one morning and says, I just want to throw my whole life away. Nobody wakes up that way, right? It happens slowly. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you're wanting to stay. You think that you're just here visiting, and the devil will lie to you and allow you to stay longer than what you want. And sin will cost you more than you're willing to pay. And temptation will hide this truth from you because it doesn't want you to know that secret about it. So as we proceed with this series, think about it. sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you're willing to pay. And temptation, well, temptation will keep that truth from you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. God, I pray that as we face temptation, and we will because, well, we live in a fallen world, and the enemy doesn't take no for an answer. And so maybe we've gotten the victory today, but Lord, we know that when we least expect it, he will be there and he will keep delivering that temptation over and over. God, I pray that in the midst of that temptation that you would remind us of this story that we read in Genesis, this very first temptation that's recorded. Lord, the nature of that temptation is the same nature of the temptation that each one of us faces in our lives. Help us to be wise, smarter than our enemy, understanding how he works. God, I pray that, Lord, when temptation comes, that, Lord, we would flee it. Or that we would understand that, that, that temptation offers sin under a filter. It's been photoshopped. It's, it's saying something that it never is able to do. God, I pray, keep us in the palm of your hand. We ask this in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior.